Hallelujah. Praise God. But uh, why am I here? Because God told me to come. Um, just a little background. First of all, I want to talk to you about the message. We're going to be tra- traveling together from uh, uh, with Elijah and Elisha from Gilgal to Bethel and from Bethel to Jericho and then across the Jordan River. And when they cross the Jordan River, Elijah turns to Elisha and he said, what is it that you need? And he said, um, before I'm taken up today, and he says, I need a double portion of your spirit. And I don't know if you'd agree with me, but right now, I think in America, we need a double portion of God's spirit operating in the church today. We need to see the miracles that are promised in Mark 16, where the people are healed and, and uh, <clears throat> people are delivered from all the different things that we struggle with in our society today. And so, uh, I believe with all my heart that God wants us to have that double portion. So how do we get that double portion to begin to move in the church? And I believe it's intimacy with Christ. I think it's like Christ said, I don't do anything except for what I see my Father in heaven doing. And I think that we aren't intimate enough with the Holy Spirit on a regular basis, um, praying and seeking God, studying the Word. But let me tell you how it started. I was raised Roman Catholic, um, going way back. Went to Catholic uh, school. Uh, married a Catholic girl who also went to Catholic school. And uh, still married to her. And... Um, and uh, and after we got married, we kind of drifted from that whole thing because uh, my degree is in engineering, and Catholicism wasn't logical to me because how could you be good enough to please God? And what was it you needed to do? Did you need to be a nun? Did you need to be a priest? Did you need to buy a brown blanket and shave your head and go to the Himalayas? What would be good enough for God? And so I kind of drifted away because it didn't make any sense. And so... Um, it was when I was 33 years old, and uh, I was talking to Sam earlier. I was the engineering manager where we manufactured the first disc for C drives, if you're familiar with that terminology. And, um, and we were going through a hectic time, working 24-7, trying to beat IBM. And one day I came home from work, and my wife said, I'm a Christian. And I thought, well, I thought we always have been Christians, you know, because there was like Jews and Muslims and, you know, and Protestants and Catholics, you know. So I thought we were Christians. And um, I said, well, I thought we've always been Christians. She says, no, this is different. She says, I, I gave my life to him, and he lives inside of me now. And I, okay, good for you. And um, <laughs> oh, I wasn't very tolerant with it. I remember when she, she was l- listening to Christian songs, and this is going to go way back, but what was B.J. Thomas? You know, he got saved, and he was singing Christian songs, and she'd listen to those songs, and I wanted to listen to Led Zeppelin, so um, she'd wear earphones. That's back when they weren't little earbuds. They were the great big earphones. She'd wear the great big earphones to listen to B.J. Thomas because I just couldn't understand what anybody was interested in religion at all. And so um, we, in fact, I had bought some land in Colorado, and I planned on being buried there, so I didn't have to be buried in a casket. It was legal to be buried in the, in the ground there, and I thought, well, I'm going to die and decay and become part of the whole cycle of life again, you know. It says in the Bible, there's a way which seems right unto man, but the ends of those ways are death. A lot of times we make up our own religions. I think most people do to some extent. And, uh, and so um, when she said that, I just kind of took it with a grain of salt, but then over the next few weeks, I saw such a change in her life, and uh, not that she was a bad person before, but I saw a peace, a joy, a relationship with the Lord, and, and it wasn't long before I said, how do I get what you've got? And, uh, and, and, you know, it's just living the life before me, and I said, how do I get what you got? And she explained to me how you get saved, and, um, and I gave my life to Christ, and that was 30-some years ago, 32 years ago, and, and it hasn't been the same since, and we began attending a Baptist church, and we were there for about a year, and it was a good time. We, a lot of good fellowship, a lot of wonderful people, but uh, we got wrecked by some people that spoke in tongues. They prayed for us, and we got baptized in the Holy Spirit and moved from the Baptist church to an Assembly of God church where we served for 18 years in various roles of lay leadership. And it was during that time that... Uh, that I was working for Campbell Soup Company as a national operations training manager, traveling the United States. And I began to see myself as a minister, a minister to all those thousands of employees as I traveled. And 
and we own many food companies, you'd recognize them, Vlasic Pickles, um, uh, Pepperidge Farm, uh, Swanson Frozen Foods, Pace Picani Sauce, Prego, uh, Chef Boyardee, it just goes on and on. Did I say Vlasic Pickles? But anyhow, um, as I traveled, oh, Godiva Chocolates, that's usually one everybody likes, but um, as I traveled, I just ministered to the people. I shared the gospel, I, I prayed with people, I, I answered biblical questions when I could, and, uh, and, and even began to visit people in the hospital when they were sick, or visit their relatives and pray for them when they were sick. And as I traveled, um, I just saw that as a ministry, but I began to share my testimony on Wednesday nights at the Assembly of God churches all over the United States, and pretty soon the pastors would ask me to, to preach, to fill in when they were out of town or something, if I was going to be in town. And so and then suddenly I'm preaching on Wednesday nights all over the United States. And I really had the best of both worlds. I had an excellent uh, position in a large international company, and, uh, and I had a nationwide ministry of sorts. And I was just loving it, but I felt in my heart there was something more. There was something else God was calling me to do. And I, I, I prayed and I prayed. I got my license with the Assemblies of God and just continued to seek the Lord and say, what is it you want me to do? <clears throat> and I was in Modesto, California, at a frozen food, Swanson frozen food plant that we owned, and, um, and decided to go down to have dinner with my son in Pasadena. And when I was, uh, it's about a five hour drive, and while I was driving, I was just really praying and asking the Lord. I was praying in tongues for a couple hours and just asking the Lord, what is it you want me to, to do? I just feel there's, an, there's something you have planned for me. And, um, and I got outside of Fresno and I found a Christian radio station and I was listening to the Christian radio station and they, they were uh, talking about Christianity and how it changed in the last 40 years in America. It was uh, Back to the Bible, have you heard of that program? Back to the Bible with Dr. Kroll. And Dr. Kroll had just taken over the ministry from, uh, 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 from Warren Wiersbe and they asked, what has changed in the 39 years that Back to the Bible had been in the radio ministry in the church in America? And the, and the response or the conclusion was two things. One, people used to come to the Lord and they said, they would say, Lord, what can I do for you? And they said, now the tendency is people come to the church and they say, uh, what can your church offer me? And uh, that was quite a change. And the second thing they said was people used to be Berean. They used to study the Word of God, and they'd go to their concordance and their commentaries and cross-references on their own, and they'd study the Word. And they said now people tend to more rely on others to study the Word for them and then tell them how they should think about what the Word says. And I just began to weep because being raised Catholic, we never had the Bible. We didn't get to study the Bible. That was the church that, and the priests and the cardinals and the bishops and the archbishops and the popes. They would tell you how to think. You weren't, you weren't privy to the Bible and the Word of God because you might start a cult. And, uh, and so uh, I was just weeping because it just broke my heart that here we are evangelical Christians all having maybe one, two, three Bibles in our homes or more and we're not studying them. And so... As I was weeping, something strange happened, and I was a pretty conservative Pentecostal Christian, but, but something really strange happened. As I was weeping, a hand came flying through the air. It was kind of from about here on the arm down. It was, it was in a fist, and it was flying through the air towards the car. And just as it was about to hit the windshield, I ducked because I thought it was going to break the windshield. But it didn't break the windshield. It came right through the window, right through the windshield, and it went into my heart, and the fist opened up, and it left a seed and vanished. And I looked down, and I saw this seed glowing in my chest, and I said, Lord, what is that? And instantly, I was taken out of the car, and I was standing in the back of a church watching as a person was speaking on intimacy with Christ, talking about how Christ had died and gone to the cross and, and resurrected again so that we could once again be in relationship, an intimate relationship with the Lord. But we had kind of forsaken that. We were doing all this stuff, but we were, we were not regarding our intimate relationship with the Lord. And he was calling the people to, to make a commitment, to come to the altar and make a commitment. And they had communion there. And they were, they were, he was emphasizing the sacrifice that Christ had made so we could walk in the garden on a daily basis with the Father again. And uh, as the people came forward, that song, I Pledge Allegiance to the Lamb, was playing. And they were making a commitment to a deeper, more personal relationship with the Lord on a daily basis. 
Then suddenly I was back in the car. And I had traveled about 35 miles, about 35 minutes on the, in, on the highway. And the, the strange thing was I was in an area called the Grapevine, which is a windy mountain pass north of Los Angeles. And I thought, Lord, how did I get through the Grapevine without being in the car? And then I heard a voice. And it said, things in America are changing. They're not going to be like they've been in the past. And my people need to know my voice, know my word, and know my will for their lives. And I said, well, what has that got to me? And I began to talk to this voice that was talking to me. And I said, what does that have to do with me? And the voice came on again, and it said, 50 states, two by air, the rest by land. Now, that seemed logical. With an engineering background, two by air, the rest by land. Surely you're not going to drive to Hawaii um, and probably not to Alaska if you're sane. But um, so it, it made sense to me that, that we, would, we would go by land to the 48 contiguous states and then to Hawaii and Alaska by air. So to my mind, I said, okay, Lord, that's what you want me to do. That's what I'll do. But I didn't know if that meant I was supposed to do it while I was working for Campbell's. That was a comforting thought. I thought, well, I'll just keep doing this and do, begin to share that message on Wednesday nights when I speak around the country. But I felt in my heart that's not what he wanted me to do. So I began to just really pray as I continued to drive the other two and a half hours. And, and uh, I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell my son about it. I'm going to tell my son about it. He was... Uh, He's a rocket scientist, and at the time he had just, at 18 years old, he had just uh, been a supervisor on the Pathfinder and Sojourner, the first successful rover to Mars. And a uh, very intelligent guy, loved the Lord, but he was going to Pastor Jack Hayford's church, and of course that's four square, and they're not quite as spiritual as us Assembly of God people, you know. So I said, well, I'm going to tell him and see what he says. And you know what I expected him to say, and I thought about it when I saw the lady with the flags, and I don't know your name, I apologize, but I knew what he was going to say to me. He was going to say, Dad, you're sitting way too close to the front row. And uh, he says, the next thing you know, you'll be on the platform with the lady with the flags, you know. But, uh, but uh, I was surprised. I shared with him at dinner, and I told him this. And, uh, and he looked at me across the table, and he said something that scared me to death. He said, Dad, I think that's something God wants you to do. And suddenly, I just got this sinking feeling in my heart. Does he want me to leave my career, leave my, my life and my income, and just go trust him and do this? And so I thought, well, I'm going to call my wife. And, you know, you can call your wife and your spouse, and you get that, you know, that resonance, you know, and that, that confirmation. And I called her up and, that night, and I said, this is what happened. I told her all about it in greater detail than we just discussed now. But... But uh, I told her all about it, and, and her response was quite different than my son's. She says, that sounds crazy. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> and I said, what sounds so crazy about it? And she says, and, and it was the worst. It was the part that I trusted in the most. She said that part about, uh, you know, two by air, the rest by land. And I said, well, what sounds so crazy about that? And she says, well, it sounds like the Paul Revere's called arms, you know. <laughs> So I kind of came down to earth, and, uh, and we agreed that we would just pray about it. I wouldn't go quit Campbell's the next morning, and then I would, we would just pray about it and seek the Lord. And so we, we, we did that. But I got the first confirmation the next morning. I got up at 3 in the morning. It was a five-hour drive. I wanted to be back at the frozen food plant by 8. So I got up at 3 in the morning and started driving back. And I prayed for about two and a half hours. And then at about 5.30, I looked at the, the dash, and it said 5.30, and I thought, well, I'm back near Fresno. I'll listen to that radio program, and because I really wasn't getting anything from the Lord. I think, well, I'll listen to that, that Christian radio station. I'll listen to the news and the weather. It's 5.30, and then, uh, then I'll go back to praying. So I turned on the radio, and instead of the news and the weather that should have come on at 5.30, it was that song, I Pledge Allegiance to the Lamb from the beginning to the end. It's like I just turned it on when the song started and it went all the way through. And I just began to weep again. I said, oh, Lord, this is really you, isn't it? This is really you. So we went on to pray for the next two years and, and just got confirmation after confirmation that we were supposed to go do this. And I had told no one but my son in California. We have two sons and a daughter. Um, our other son's a, a computer expert for a large international architectural firm, and our daughter is just uh, 
she's Barbie in reincarnate. If you saw her, she's got five kids, and she, she just looks like a Barbie doll. She's just so pretty and wonderful, and, and uh, everybody's saying, well, you just say that, but you ought to see her. But anyhow, um, she looks like her mother. But anyhow, uh, uh, we, did, we told nobody. My wife knew, my son knew, and we told my pastor because I wanted to make sure that I was, you know, still on the planet. And, uh, and so we, we prayed for two years, and God just gave us confirmation after confirmation. At the end of the two years, I, I was praying with a friend of mine that I prayed with every Monday night, a uh, big guy named Gar, he's, you know, just like his name sounds, you know, he's a huge man. And uh, we'd pray together. We'd just pray down the whole nation, you know, every Monday night. And, and as I was praying, the Lord said, tell Gar. And I said, well, I haven't told anybody, Lord, about this because I'm wanting confirmations, you know, that are true and nobody knows about it. Nobody's just coming to me because they think I want to hear what they have to say. <clears throat> but I felt impressed to tell Gar. So I told Gar the whole story. And uh, he said, Jim, what more do you need? After he heard all the confirmations, I said, I said, I need one more thing. Remember I just told you about Elijah and Elisha and the double anointing? I said, I need a double anointing of M.F. Brandt. Now, M.F. Brandt had been the superintendent of the state of Nebraska. He had died at 93 just uh, about a year before I was talking to Gar, and he'd been my mentor for years. And he would tell me these wonderful stories about how God had really moved powerfully back in the early 1900s and, and how he'd seen miracles and just beyond my comprehensions. And he'd tell them with such incredible detail, I could just sit on the edge of my chair and listen to him tell about how God had moved in a mighty way. And he had come from California to Nebraska. Now, you know you're called from God when you, when you leave Southern California and come to minister in Nebraska. And because uh, if you've ever been in Nebraska, it's cold in the wintertime and hot in the summertime and humid. And so he, he'd come there and, uh, and become the superintendent of, of the state. But, but when he first came there, he was just pastoring in a small church. They had a small parsonage. It was a little tiny, almost a one-room kind of a, of a house. And they had a potbelly stove in the, in the center of the room. And, and, and he was praying. He said, you know, he said, I'm here with my family. I left California. It's in the middle of the winter in Nebraska. I'm sitting here before this potbelly stove. That's the only heat we have in the house. And I've got one last piece of coal. And he says, I'm going to put that in there. And then I'm going to pray to God that he would do a miracle. And he began to pray, and, and just a few minutes later, he got a knock on the door, and uh, he answered the door. And here stood a man from the community. He didn't go to his church. He was one of the leaders of the community. He was standing there in a long black wool coat. Uh, it was very cold outside. He could see it underneath the coat that the man had on a nightshirt, you know, the old kinds with the, the, they were white with red and blue stripes. Some of the people remember it. Some of you guys, it's, you had to see it in black and white TV and you couldn't see the red and blue stripes, but anyhow. But, uh, but he was standing there, he had this large burlap bag and he shoves the bag at MF. He says, here, I can't sleep. And he left, never to discuss it ever again, never to come to MF's church. He went to one of the Presbyterian churches or something, you know, and he wouldn't cross the tracks to the Assembly of God Church. In those days, you know, we swang from the chandeliers. I notice your chandeliers are still there, but they're pretty high. But, um, but he, he opened up the bag, and you know what was in the bag, don't you? Coal. And he'd tell that and tell how God provided for him in his ministry for all those years and how God just met their needs over and over again. But if, if I may, I'll tell you another one, and then I'll, then I'll go on with the message. But he, he also he told me this story. I just loved it. There was a, a, an elderly lady that came to his church, but her husband would never come because it was on the wrong side of the tracks. You, you know, he wouldn't come to one of those Pentecostal churches. You know, he was a businessman in the community, and she was an elderly woman. She came every time the church doors were open, she was there. And one evening, about 2 o'clock in the morning, he heard a knock on the door, and as he went to the, he went to the door, there was, uh, there was her husband standing there. And he says, my wife goes to your church, right? And MF says, yes, she does. And he says, you guys believe that healing is still for today, right? And he says, yes, we do. He said, well, you better come to my house. My wife's dying. And so MF grabbed his stuff, and he began to head for the house. And 
fearing that she'd already be dead by the time he got there. And uh, he, he grabbed his coat and his clothes and, and just ran out the door. And as he's gone out the door, the Holy Spirit said, go back and get your anointing oil. And he went back to get his anointing oil. And he took that, <clears throat> he took that anointing oil and he, he went there and he thought, what am I going to do, Lord? How am I going to, am I going to share with the family if she's already gone? What do you want me to do? And the Holy Spirit just kept saying, anoint her with oil and pray for her. Anoint her with oil and pray for her. And he got to the house and as he got to the house, she was laying on the dining room table because there was no nearby hospitals and, and she was laid out on the dining room table and the doctor was there and the doctor was filling out a piece of paper and he goes over to her and he anoints her with oil and begins to pray for her and just then the doctor says, MF, you're too late, she's already gone. He says, I'm filling out the death certificate right now and he says, I'm gonna take it to the corner. And MF said, but the Holy Spirit told me to pray for her, anoint her with oil and pray for her and, and he just continued to pray for her and the doctor left and he just continued to pray for her, and everything went the wrong direction. She began to get colder and grayer and losing her color, what little color she had when he got there, and, and it seemed to be going the wrong direction. Then the coroner showed up, and the coroner said, MF, I came to get her, I, I came to get her, and, and he says, but the Lord told me to anoint her with oil and pray for her. He says, well, it's late. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to take her, and <clears throat> the doctor's already given me this death certificate. She's gone, MF. And MF said, well, just give me a few more minutes. Will you go out in the parlor and wait with the family and just give me a few more minutes? And he continued to pray for her, and she sat up and lived another 10 years. And I told Gar, if I'm going to America, MF went to Nebraska, and if, I'm, if God is calling me to go to all 50 states, then I have to have double the anointing that MF had. And so Gar began to pray for me, and, and as he finished praying for me that I would get that double anointing, our phone rang just a few minutes later. And I picked up the phone, and I answered the phone, and I said, hello, and, and, the, and the person on the other end of the line said, this is Gene Brandt. Now, Gene Brandt was MF's son. Now, at that time, Gene was already in his 60s. And he said, I'm retiring, Jim, and I'm going to the RV ministry in Springfield. We bought an RV and we're going. And he says, uh, I got some things that I think that you need to have. And I said, okay. And he said, can I come over right now? We're leaving tomorrow. And I said, okay. And he came over and as bright as I am, it didn't dawn on me the connection between Gene Brandt and MF Brandt. It just didn't register. And he came over and he had a little box of stuff and I'm going through the box of stuff and I'm finding stuff that I think, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this. There was a beautiful leather bound Bible, it's not this one, but a beautiful leather bound Bible. But the problem is, is it had the name of the ministry on the front in gold, you know, in Boston gold. And I can't tell you the name of the minister because that would indict him, but it was a minister that had just fallen and, and it was national news that he had just fallen and it was his study Bible. <laughs> And I thought, well, I can't give this to anybody at work because they're all making fun of me because these ministers, are, these AG ministers are falling. And, and so I said, well, that's nice. Maybe I can use it myself, you know? And then, and then I, I go digging through the, I actually thought, I wonder if I could scrape that off, but then I remembered all the notes inside had his name on it. But, um, but as I go through it, the next book I, I found was a book called Pigs in a Parlor. Now you're too young to remember that, aren't you, Pastor? Do you remember that book? No. No, pigs in a parlor. It, there's some people that remember pigs in a parlor, and it was a question of whether or not assembly got, well, it, the question of not born again Christians could be possessed of the devil. Pigs in the parlor. And the assemblies of God had just come out and said, don't buy the book, don't read the book, don't share the book with anybody else because, because we don't believe that, that, a, that a Christian can be demon possessed. So I'm thinking, I got this book, this Bible that I can't use. I got this book that I can't use. I'm thinking, there must be something in here. I don't know what it is. And I continue to dig. And as I was digging through, I found his wife's lipstick at the bottom of the box. And I said, Gene, his wife's name is Artie. I said, Gene, do you think Artie wants this tube of lipstick back? And as I drew it out of the box, I was just kind of drawing it out of the box. And as I drew it out of the box, I noticed as I looked up that, that Gene had tears in his eyes. Now here's a 60-something-year-old man, and he's got tears running down his face. And he says, Jim, he says, that's not Artie's lipstick. He said, that's my father's anointing oil vial, the one he used when he prayed for that lady and brought her back from the dead. And Gar looks at me, he says, what do you need now? 
And Gene went on to explain that for the, the last several months that he and Artie had been arguing, he thought they'd keep it as a family heirloom. And, and Artie thought that MF would want me to have it. And he said that night he was putting that stuff in the box. He says the Holy Spirit just spoke clearly to him and said, take that to Jim. I want Jim to have it. So then I knew that I knew. I mean, God was instant, instant. It was better than nest tea. I mean, I, we prayed and he was there, you know. And so it, it was instant. There was no doubt that I was supposed to take this message to the 50 states. And, and we began to get our finances in a situation and we set up a, a nonprofit organization and, and everything that was necessary. And, um, and a few months later, I left Campbell's and just went out trusting entirely in God. And that's what we're doing now. And so we've been taking the message, like I said, from Delaware to Hawaii. Um, it was interesting. In Hawaii, I, I went to Hawaii, and I thought, well, this friend of mine invited me to go to Hawaii, Pastor. And, and my wife and I went there. His, son, his, his children had planned on going, and they couldn't go. So they invited us to go along. And, and we got there, and... and uh, and when we got there, I thought, well, I'm going to network with some pastors. I'm going to talk with some pastors, and I'm going to, I'm going to network with them so I can come back to Hawaii and preach the message. And uh, we went to church on Sunday morning, and, and that wasn't going to work. I could tell right away that was not where I was going to go preach, although it turned out good Monday morning. He and I went boar hunting, never been wild boar hunting before, but uh, we went wild boar hunting. Then Sunday night, we went to another church after we'd been at the beach, I like to boogie board. You guys know what boogie boarding is? I like to boogie board. Even as old as I am, I love to boogie board. And I'm boogie boarding. My shoes are full of sand. And, and I took a shower on the beach, you know, one of those things at the beach. And we go to church Sunday night. And um, I'm in the service. And, and I had introduced myself to the pastor. Didn't tell him anything about the ministry. But uh, told him that uh, I was an Assembly of God pastor from the mainland. And he said, oh, good, I'm going to introduce you. <clears throat> and I said, okay. And his wife did the announcements, and it was just wonderful. She was Filipino, and she did the most animated announcements I've ever seen in my life. I mean, she was running back and forth. She had flags. She had banners. And I, I just wanted to go at everything she, she was talking about. I don't know why everybody in the church wouldn't go. And, uh, but in the midst of all that, he got up and began to preach, and he got to his second point. He was preaching in, in 1 John. He got to his second point, and, uh, and he suddenly stops and he looks down at me and he said, oh my gosh, he said, uh, there's a pastor here from the mainland and I, I was going to introduce him, I forgot. So he said, pastor, could you come up here? I want to introduce you. And as I was walking up the, 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 to the platform, he, he just embraced me and he said, he said, I've got a mess. He says, you've got a message from the Lord for my church and I'm to sit down. The Holy Spirit just spoke to me more clearly than he ever has before. The good news is we've been to Hawaii with the message the bad news is we don't need to go back to Hawaii. But anyhow, <laughs> we, uh, we presented the message there and the church responded. It's just miracles. Um, in a moment, you'll hear the song, I Pledge Allegiance to the Lamb. I like to end this service with that song because that was the song that it ended with in the vision that I had. And I asked them if they knew that song and the, and the, the worship leader said, no, I don't. I don't know that song. And... Uh, one of the band, band members or one of the guitar players said, um, I heard it on the radio the other day. I can at least play the chorus. And they began to play the chorus and began to sing the song. And they ended up singing the whole song word for word. And they got done. And the, the guy's name was Dan. He came up to me. Dan came up to me and he said, he said, I don't know how that happened. He said, I have no clue where that song came from. And so we know that we know that God has this message. And we know that this is the church where we're supposed to be in Massachusetts. Never been to Massachusetts before. This is where we're supposed to be in Massachusetts. So now we're going to go to the message. And, uh, and we haven't got there yet. And it's 824. I got one minute. But anyhow, <laughs> please bear with me. Please bear with me. Pastor's from Nebraska at one time in his life, so he's not going to throw me out. Because how often do you get somebody all the way from Nebraska to come? I mean, we're like from a, we're like foreign, we're, we're like foreigners together, you know, from Nebraska. But uh, so, praise God. Let's go to that message. Go to 2 Kings chapter 2, and we're going to talk about Elijah and Elisha. And it came about when the Lord was about to take up Elijah by the whirlwind to heaven that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now, Elijah... 
I hope you're getting ahead of me a little bit. I'll, I'll kind of let you know, Mark, when to change. But he's trying to do it in one minute. But anyhow. <laughs> and it came about when the Lord was about to take Elijah by whirlwind to heaven that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now let me explain to you. Elijah means the Lord is my God. And, the Lord, and Elisha means the Lord is my salvation. So as we take this little trip together, we're going to walk together with them from city to city, just as if Elijah was our Lord and we're the Lord is our salvation, Elisha. And Gilgal is the place of cutting off. That's where we first got born again, if you want to think of it that way. That's where Joshua circumcised his troops before they went into, before they went into the battle of Jericho. And you know, it's funny, but... When they put back on their robes, you probably never think, think about things like this, but when they put back on their robes, they didn't have gym class, they didn't have public restrooms. When those guys put their robes back on, nobody knew whether they were really truly circumcised or not. And it says in Romans that we're no longer circumcised of the flesh, but we're what? Circumcised of the heart. And nobody can really tell whether or not we are circumcised of the heart. Maybe our spouse, I suppose their spouses knew whether they were circumcised or not. But maybe our spouses know whether we're circumcised to the heart or not. But the question, are we truly circumcised to the heart? But, you know, he says to, he says to him, he says, I'm going to go in the next verse, Mark. He says in the next verse, and Elijah said, Elisha, just stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. He said, stay here. He says, stay here at Gilgal. And, you know, all of us know somebody that stayed there at Gilgal. It's that person at work where you finally build up the courage. They, they don't shut you off when you talk about Jesus and, and you think, boy, I'm going to lead them to the Lord and you present the gospel to them and they said, I'm already saved. And you're thinking to yourself, boy, you never could have proven it by me, but, but, you know, they were saved at eight years old. They went forward at a Baptist church. Or at 17, they went to a youth group and they gave their life to the Lord at a rally and they never did anything. And Elijah says to Elisha, you can just stay here. See, God is looking for us. He's looking for our heart. His Holy Spirit goes throughout the whole earth looking for that heart that's sold out to him. He's not going to take you kicking and screaming into what you're going to be called to. He already did that with Paul. But he's waiting for you. He says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. He said, you can just stay here. But Elisha responds, as the Lord lives, as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went on to Bethel. He says, I'm going with you no matter what. And that's a question in our hearts. Obviously, we're not still at Gilgal or we wouldn't be here on a Wednesday night. But they went on to Bethel. And you know what Bethel means? Gilgal means place of cutting off. Bethel means the house of God. And see, some of us have gotten to the house of God and we found our place, we found our pew, and nobody better sit there but us. And we never have to say that. You just know that they sit there and we don't. I remember I was once in George Washington's church where George Washington went to church. Has anybody been there before? I was in George Washington church and they have real big high walls around the pews so you can't see the people sleeping. And, <laughs> and, and it was funny because they had, they, had, they had sticks with feathers on them so that the ushers, so the ushers, if, if you fell asleep, the usher would come and tickle you if you were a lady. But if you're a man, they had, they had long sticks with a bopper on the end, you know. It was rags wrapped up in a rag. And if you're a man and you were sleeping, they came in and bopped you on the head. So here you are hiding inside this little box where nobody can see what you're doing. And the, and the guy keeps coming by and bopping you on the head or ticking you with a feather. You know exactly who's sleeping in that pew. But anyhow... Anyhow, some of us come and we get involved and, and we just, you know, we come on fire. We're all ready to do whatever God calls us to do. And we just kind of settle in. And it's interesting because look at what happens at Bethel in the next verse. Then the sons of the prophet or Bethel came to Elisha and said to him, do, not, do you not know the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he says, yes, I know. Shut up. You see that up there? Yes, I know. Shut up. 
The sons of the prophet who were at Bethel, these were the schools of the prophets, the school that Elijah himself had set up. And how often are there people that are born again and in relationship with the Lord to some extent, and you talk about what God has called you to do, and they're like, whoa, don't go there. Just stay here. Don't you know that Jesus is coming back for the church pretty soon? What are you going to go and do something crazy like that for? So there's people right here together with us, maybe not in this church, but there's people right here in this town that are born-again believers, and when you talked about getting baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, they're, whoa, don't go there. When we got filled with the Holy Spirit, we, we were told by some of our friends that that might be of the devil. You better not go to that church. Power, power, dunamis power. That's what God wants us to have. And he gave it to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. He wants us filled with the Holy Spirit. He wants us to be empowered. He needs us to be empowered. He doesn't have an army that's full of weaklings. He has an army that's full of the Holy Spirit. But some would tell you, just stay here. And that's what the inference is. Do you not know the Lord will take your master away from you today? Just stay here with us. And Elisha turns and, and says, you can stay here. But, you know, he said, yes, I know. Shut up. And sometimes we don't have to say shut up to the other people. Sometimes we have to say shut up to ourselves. To that little voice in our mind that says, surely God hasn't called you to do something that radical. Surely God doesn't want you to leave your career at Campbell's Soup and, and, and the, the American dream and go off and do something crazy. I mean, you're going to call up pastors and they're going to hang up on you. Can you imagine that, calling pastors? You don't, know, you don't know them, you never met them before in your life, and you call them up and you say, I got a word for your church. And then there's this silence and then a click on the other end. I can't approach it quite like that, but... That was my fear. Nobody's going to want me to come. 50 states? How am I going to get to 50 states? See, we begin to rationalize it. In some place in our mind, we got to say, shut up. Move from Chapel, Nebraska to Agawam, Massachusetts. Did I pronounce it right? You got to be crazy. You see, but if we're hearing the voice of the Lord and we're knowing the voice of the Lord, but if we don't know his voice, he says, my sheep know my voice and they come in and they go out. When we know his voice, we, we go and do what he's called us to do. If we don't know his voice, we might just try stuff. And then when we try stuff and it fails, then we think, well, God doesn't want me to do that. Because sometimes the Lord wants us, he's prepared Sam's heart for us to go share the gospel with them that day and, and out of guilt because pastor preached on evangelism on Sunday, I'm going to go and I'm going to witness to Jerry. And Jerry doesn't accept the Lord. I'm like, Lord, why am I doing this? All I'm doing is getting rejection and embarrassment. And the Lord's up there saying, why didn't you go to Sam? If you had just talked to me this morning, I could have told you today is Sam's day. So, Elijah, the next verse, Elijah says to him, just stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. This guy is persistent. God needs persistent Christians. People that are determined to do what he's called them to do, no matter what. When we're done with this trip, it'll be 46 states. And, you know, and, and some states we've been to many times. And as we're driving, it took us three days to drive here. And as you're driving all those miles, because the Lord said, two by air, the rest by land. And we're driving and we're praying for the states, and you're like, man, my feet are tired, my back is tired. Is this really what you want me to do, Lord? And you just got to pray in the Spirit and know that you got to keep moving and keep going because there's people here tonight who are going to give themselves in a deeper way to the Lord than they've ever given it before. I'm not talking about getting born again again. I'm talking about saying, Lord, I want to spend that time with you that I'm spending with ESPN, that I'm spending on TV, watching soap operas, texting people, Facebooking people. I want to spend that time with you, Lord. 
And there has to be a commitment. There's got to be a place where we kind of draw the line in the sand and say, I don't care where you're going, I'm going with you. So they came to Jericho. Now Jericho is an interesting place. That's a place of misplaced faith. They were never supposed to rebuild in Jericho. And in fact, the prophet told the king, if you rebuild in Jericho, your two sons are going to die, and they did. They were not supposed to rebuild on Jericho because you know what Jericho is? Jericho is a place of misplaced faith. See, you go back to that place and rebuild on Jericho thinking that God's going to do the miracles for you that he did for Joshua. And we do the same thing today. We watch Benny Hinn on TV. Boy, if we can just see somebody really healed. If we can just see somebody really get out of a wheelchair. If we can just really see somebody completely healed, then, then we'll believe and we'll go pray in the hospitals for the sick. But some reason we watch that and because we're trusting in Benny Hinn's faith and not our own faith, we're trusting in his deep relationship with the Lord and not our deep relationship with the Lord. Maybe it's Billy Graham. When I first got saved, I thought, well, nobody in my neighborhood's going to hear me about getting saved. We live in a nice neighborhood, and all the people were professional, very successful people. And <clears throat> I was afraid to witness to them because I thought they'd reject me. Because up to that point, I thought the only people who needed Jesus was, were, were failures and, and crippled old ladies. Because if you could do it, you could do it on your own, right? And so I think I'm going to go to my neighbors, and they're going to think, I, you know, I failed somewhere. I obviously wasn't a crippled old lady, but, you know, it was, I thought, well, I can't go to them. So you know what I did? I'd wait till Billy Graham was on TV, and I'd call him up and say, hey, Billy Graham's going to be on TV. Watch him tonight. And then I'd sit in my bedroom and pray that they'd get saved while they watched Billy Graham. <laughs> what I didn't realize that it said that the enemy is defeated by what? The blood of the Lamb and the word of whose testimony? My testimony. God had called me to that neighborhood, not Billy Graham. And there's nothing wrong with watching Billy Graham. There's nothing wrong with any of that. It's nothing wrong with Benny Hinn, I don't think. And, and so, but God has put you where he's put you because he needs a soldier where you are. Amen. Thank you for that applause. I hope it wasn't you were hoping that I was done. But anyhow... So, I'm still okay, Pastor? Okay, I'm trying to hurry. I know there's people with kids and stuff like that, isn't there? Is there there's kids things going on tonight. So, um, pray for the, if, lift up a silent prayer for all those children's people that are watching the kids. But, but uh, so, Jericho's that place of misplaced faith. And you can tell it because look what it says next. Watch this. The sons of the prophet of Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, do you not know the Lord will take your master from you today? And he answered, yes, I know, shut up, right? But look at this, the next verse. Then Elijah said to him, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Now, look at the next verse. Now the 50 men of the sons of the prophet went and stood opposite them at a distance, Let's not get too close to these fanatics. We'll stand at a distance and watch. See, God didn't create a spectator sport. He's called us all to be part of the army of God. He's called us all to be sharing the gospel. He's called us all to pray for the sick and see them healed. He's called us all to pray for those who are addicted and afflicted and see them delivered. So why aren't we doing that? Why are we standing at a distance watching? And I believe in my heart it's because we lack that intimacy with the Lord. We don't really know what he wants us to do because we haven't taken that time to find out. We've got our ticket to heaven. We're waiting for the rapture. Master's going to be taken up from you today. We're going to go up in the rapture. Isn't that amazing? We don't know when the rapture's coming. We're talking about it's going to come here, it's going to come there. We got this theory and that theory. These guys knew to the day when Elijah was going to be taken up. And they stood at a distance to watch. They should have been right there with Elisha and saying, we want to go with you. Wherever you're going, you're going up today. We want to get that last bit of, of, of anointing. We want to get that last bit of knowledge. We want to get that last bit 
before you're taken up today. These were his college students. And they stood and watched. We've got too many Christians today standing and watching. Primarily because we really just don't know our Savior. If Jesus said, I don't do anything except what I see the Father in heaven doing, don't you think that's good enough for us? We should be praying, Lord, show me today. Show me today what's going to happen. Show me today who I'm supposed to go to, who I'm supposed to share the gospel with. Show me today where I'm supposed to go and pray for the sick. Show me today he, who, who needs deliverance. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the 12-step program, and we as a church to support programs like that, that that help people get set free. But have we first prayed for them to be delivered of the power that's holding them in that, in that addiction? Should we first trust God to do his thing before we trust the counselors and the doctors to do their thing? I had, uh, right after we went into the ministry, I had my first attack of angina. Does anybody know what angina is? That's where your heart starts hurting really bad. And they took me into the hospital at 1 o'clock in the morning on my 51st birthday. And I got in there, and the doctor said, I got some bad news for you. I said, what's that? And he says, there's an artery called the widow maker. If it closes up, you drop dead. And he says, yours is almost closed up. He said, I have to go in and put a stent in. So he went in and put a stent in. A month later, I'm back in there. It's, it's happened all over again. And he looks at it. And he says, you know what? That stent isn't just right where it should be. He says, I'm going to come up from a different direction, put another stent in. So he came up from another direction, he put another stent in. A month later, I'm back in there. I said, man, this is not working. And he says, well, you know, that stent, the second stent I put in, and this is one of the best cardiologists in the Omaha area with University of Nebraska and all that there. And, and uh, he said, the second stent is kind of blocking the first one. He says, you're going to have to have bypass surgery. So they took me and they did bypass surgery. And when they did bypass surgery, they did some, a, a new technique that they were just experimenting with where they drilled laser holes in your heart with a laser beam. And I got out, and, and, and a couple weeks later, I'm in the hospital doing a follow-up. I'm feeling pretty good, and he's checking my heart, but I'm feeling kind of tired and weak. I don't feel like I'm really coming back to it. And, and he says... Uh, he says, let's do an ultrasound. And so he did an ultrasound on my heart. And he says, well, Jimmy, he says, I got some bad news for you. And I said, what's that? And he says, well, the bypass is working fine. But you know that part of your heart? There's a, there's a quarter of your heart that's not working anymore. We, we must have cut a, an artery with the laser. We must have cut a, a, a nerve with the laser. Not an artery, cut a nerve with the laser. And he says, a quarter of your heart's not working. He says, you're going to be on medication the rest of your life. And I said, I said well, what can you do? You know, thinking there's a next operation. I just had three. What's the next one? And he says, there's nothing we can do. Those nerves are too tiny. You can't even see it with a microscope. And he said, there's no way we can fix that. He says, you're just going to be on medication for the rest of your life. You're going to be weak and tired all the rest of your life. And the Holy Spirit said to me right then, he said, that's not true. And I said to the doctor, I said, that's not true. Well, they don't receive that really well. He's, he's Catholic, and I had been witnessing to him for quite some time and, and through all these processes over these, all these months. And, and, uh, and in one time, at one time, he sat in my room for eight hours. We sat in a room together for eight hours, and I witnessed to him for the whole eight hours. And, and I said, the Holy Spirit just told me that's not true, Doc, that it's going to come back to life. And he says, well, all the times I've ever seen this, I've never seen one come back to life. So four years went by, and I continued to take the medication that he had told me to take. And at the end of the four years, I had angina again. They rushed me into the doctor's office. Now he's got a clinic where he can go up there and check it right there in his office. And he goes up there, and he checks it. He says, Jim, I got some good news and some bad news. And I said, well, tell me the good news first. And he says, well, the good news is, you know that quarter of your heart that I said would never work again? And you said the Holy Spirit said it would, it would work again? He said, I was wrong. The Holy Spirit was right. 
He said, the bad news is your bypass has collapsed and the arteries are clogged worse than they've ever been before. And he says, we got to go in right away. I got to take you to the hospital right now. We got to go in and see what we can do. But he says, I got to do it in the hospital because if, if it doesn't work, I could tear an artery or something and, and we'd need to open you up right away. So I said, you know what, doc? The Holy Spirit just encouraged me that he could heal that part of my heart that you said couldn't be healed. I said, I'm going to believe for him to heal the rest of my arteries. I says, I'm going to go this weekend. That was on a Wednesday. I said, I'm going to go this weekend, and I'm going to get prayer on Saturday. I'm going to be anointed with oil. That's what the Bible says. That go to the elders of the church, have anointed you with oil, and pray for you. Amen. So I went that. I went that. He said, well, keep your nitro nearby you, you know, because remember, it's the, it's the widow maker. And so I, I went and got prayer on Saturday, and I went into the hospital on Tuesday. That was the first opening that they had, that he was there at the hospital. And I'm on, the, I'm on the surgery table, and you can be awake if you want when they go up there to investigate it. And he's going up there to investigate it, and he said, Jim, I'm pulling out. And I thought right away, it's too diseased. He can't do anything with it. You know, man of great faith as I am, you know, that's <laughs> the first thought I had. And I said, Doc, why are you pulling out? <laughs> and I felt like he said, you have little faith. But anyhow... He said, I'm pulling out because you've been healed. You received a healing from God. That was, was, that was almost six years ago, and I'm not on any kind of heart medication whatsoever at all. That's our God. He had a purpose for me. And there was even a greater purpose than that because about five years after that it happened, I met his wife for the first time at a thing at the high school. And he began to introduce me to his wife and he, he got a buzzer and you know, he had to go right away. He said, I gotta leave. He says, um, and I felt kind of awkward because here I'm getting introduced to his wife and he leaves in the middle of it. And I began to explain to her who, who I am. This is five years after that happened. It was about a year and a half ago. She says, oh, you don't need to tell me who you are. And I said, what do you mean? She says, ever since that happened to you, my husband has done nothing but talk about Jesus and read the Bible. <laughs> See, that's, that's a demonstration of the supernatural. You know, we can take our neighbor's cookies, and that's a good thing. We can bake them a pie. We can go and help mow their grass. We can do a lot of good things. And those things are all wonderful. But you know what the church is, our distinctive is? We are supernatural. We are supernatural beings operating in a natural world, and we have the power of God operating through us to see it happen so that people know that we serve a God that is a God of all the universe. But Elijah, get, let me keep going. Elijah took his mantle and folded together and struck the waters, and they were divided here and there, so the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Now, I like this part because I believe that Elijah took his mantle and he walked up there and he walked up to the river and he struck the river and the river opened up while they were just talking. See, he's been doing this kind of stuff for years and he walks up to the river and he strikes the river and he says, you know, open up or whatever he says. I don't know if he even said a word and he strikes the river and it, op and it parts and they walk on a cross. Much like, you know, they have garage door openers in Agawam, don't they? You push the button and the garage door opens up. I got one of those, and I, I'd hide it on the seat next to my, next to my, where I sit, you know, and, I, and my grandkids are in the car. I'd push the button. I'd say, open sesame. And I'd push the button, and they'd say, wow, Papa, how do you do that? They figured it out later. But anyhow, I think he just went up there like he's pushing a garage door button, and he, and he walks across the river. And he gets across the river, they walk across on dry ground, and he gets across the river, and he turns to Elisha, and look at the next verse, it says, and he says to Elisha, and when they crossed over, ask what, you sh what I shall do for you before I'm taken for me. And Elisha said, please let me have a double portion of the spirit, of your spirit upon me. He wanted a double portion of that spirit that was upon Elijah. Now, if it was me, I would have said the same thing because I'm going to be on the wrong side of the desert at the wrong time of night. See, they started out in Gilgal, even if they started at four in the morning, by the time they go to Bethel and then to Jericho and then back down to the Jordan River, the sun's going down, it's getting dark, and all the enemies of Israel are on the wrong side of the Jordan River. 
And he's looking at that coat and he says, you know what, I need twice that because I got to make sure I get back across the river when you're taken up. Because I don't want to be stuck on the wrong part of town at the wrong time of night. And I'm an Israelite. We can only appreciate that today as the people struggle in Israel today as they're being bombed and everything else. He said, I need a double portion of what you've got. And this is what Elijah says to him. Elijah says, you've asked a hard thing. I don't know if you've ever seen that in there before. You've asked a hard thing. See, we ask for God to do miracles in our lives, and yet we don't spend that time with him. We don't spend time in his word. We don't spend time in intimate relationship with him, and yet we want God to just work through us when we lay on our hands on somebody. And then we're disappointed when he does it. He said, you've asked a hard thing. He said, nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you today, it shall be so for you. But if not, you sh it shall not be so. If you stick with me as I go deeper in the desert and it gets darker and darker and darker and it looks like you have no way back, if you keep following me, if you keep stepping ahead and trusting in me, if we keep stepping ahead and we keep praying on people, there, there's a... There's a <clears throat> A minister, her name's Heidi Baker. She's in uh, Mozambique. And uh, she's prayed for me before. And with, oh, it's just incredible. But, but she prayed for, I think, 90 people that were blind before the 91st person saw. 90 people. Where would we have quit? And says, if you stick with me till you go up. And then he's saying another thing. He says, and you see me being taken away from you today. If you're in a spiritual place, supernatural spiritual place, that you actually see me being taken up instead of I just vanish, if you see into the spirit realm, then I can give you this. If not, I can't. And it wasn't really his choice. It was really, it was really a condition saying, if you're not in a place that you continue to follow me, and if you're not in a place that you can see into the supernatural realm, you're not going to get this. You're just going to be on the wrong side of the desert at the wrong time of, time of night. But look what it says next. It says, as they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up in a whirlwind to heaven. And then the next verse says, and Elisha saw it. He saw it. The criteria was filled. He stuck with him and he saw it. And he cried out, my father, my father. In church, we have to get to a place where we can follow God to a point that we can look at him and cry out, Abba, Abba. That we can truly trust God that he is going to act through us as he says in this word. We can't keep quitting every time we don't see the results that we think we should see. He said, you lay hands on the sick and they get healed. So I'm going to lay hands on the sick and if I don't see it, I don't know what to do, but I'll keep laying hands on the sick. And I'll keep on laying hands on the sick. And I'll keep trusting God to heal the sick. But we have to get to a place where we can cry out, my father, my father, where we trust him like a father, not like our earthly fathers, but a father that will provide everything that is necessary. Jesus said, ask whatever you want. See, if we're out there doing his ministry, if we're doing what he's called us to do, and it doesn't, I'm not talking about full-time ministry, I'm talking about in your neighborhood, in your job, in your family, wherever you're called. You may be called to full-time ministry, I don't know, but, but wherever, you're, wherever you are, when you act upon it, when you act upon it, but see what we do is we reason, oh Lord, what if I lay hands on this sick person and they don't get healed, what do I do? They might feel bad or they might. So we do all these rationalizations. What does the word of God say? It says we're going to lay hands on them. That's what it's going to say. That's all we do. We're just soldiers in the army. We just do what we're told to do. We don't reason away God's word. We look into God's word and say, what does he tell me that I'm supposed to do? And then I go do it. And he saw Elijah no more and he took hold of his own clothes and he tore them in two pieces. The next thing we do is we prepare for God to put his anointing on us, for him to put his ministry on us. And the first thing we have to do is we have to tear off who we were. We got to tear off who we were and quit trusting in who we are. 
Quit trusting in our own pride. Quit trusting in our own abilities and begin to trust in God and God alone. Now, he's given you natural abilities and he gave those to you for a reason, but we got to get to a point where we don't trust in our own self, but we trust in God and his word and the truth that's in his word. We have to get to a place. See, their clothes represented who they were. His clothes represented him as the associate prophet. We know Pastor Steve is the pastor over young adults. Because if Pastor Adams were here, he'd wear a tie and a suit coat and everything, right? So we can tell he's a, he's a pastor over young adults. We, we have something that demonstrates who we are. Doctors wear certain clothes. You go to the hospital, you know who's the surgeon and who's the bedpan guy. Just based on what they have on, right? He tore off his old clothes. He tore off who he was in order to put on the robe of the prophet. We have to tear off who we are and allow Jesus Christ to operate fully through us. And that's an ongoing process, a dying daily to who we are because our pride keeps rising up all the time. And then he says this. It says, he goes back to the river. He took the mantle that fell upon him and he returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan River. And it says that he took his, the next, it says that he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and struck the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? You know, just as Elisha, just as Elijah had taken that and like a garage door opened her, just opened it up. That's not the way it's written here for Elisha. It says he went up there and he took that and he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? In expectation, I want to see him operating through me. Where is that Lord God of Elijah? And when he had struck the waters, they were divided here and there, and Elisha crossed over, <clears throat> and Elisha succeeded Elijah. You know what Jesus said to the church? He said, you're going to do greater things than I did. You're going to do greater things than I did. Where is that church? Where is that today in the church? It's waiting for somebody to say, I want to see Jesus Christ operating through my ministry. I want to see Jesus Christ operating through me here on earth today. I want to see Jesus Christ and the power of Christ operating through me because Jesus said I was going to do greater things than he did. I don't want to back off. He stood at that river and those guys were standing on the other side. And what a risk he took when he took that robe, he took that mantle, and he struck that water. What if it hadn't parted? What if it hadn't parted? And see, too many of us stop. We stop before we start because we're afraid of what people will say if it doesn't work. But God didn't say, stop and see what other people think. He said, go do it. He said, go do it. And he walked up there that river with all his energy and all his intent, and he struck that river. He said, now I want to see the Lord God of Elijah. With all the confidence that Elijah said, if you get it, you do it. And you know, he went on to do twice the miracles that Elijah did. Twice, almost verbatim, twice the miracles that Elijah did. And Christ told us, that this would be the mark of his church. They laid hands on the sick and they'd be healed. They'd cast out demons. They would speak in other tongues. That's the mark of his church. And don't you think it's time? Look at the next scripture. This is the last one I've got up there. Now when the sons of the prophet were Jericho opposite saw him, they said the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha and they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Wouldn't it be great that if the Holy Spirit started operating through us in a supernatural way when we walk in confidence like Elisha did and the world begins to look at us and say, you know what, you guys aren't like any other religion. You aren't like any other religion. God is operating through you. 
the sons of the prophet saw that, the, that God was operating through Elisha. The Lord is my salvation. And they fell down and said, show us what to do. See, when the church begins to really operate in the supernatural, then the world will begin to say, show us what we need to do. When I saw my wife change, as much as I didn't like anything to do with religion, I saw the Holy Spirit change her. I knew that it was real. We have got to get to a point that the world knows that what we're doing is real. So I'm going to ask you, because we're out of time a long time ago, I'm going to ask you, as that song, just a minute, don't put it on yet, Mark. He's going to play that song in a second. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. And I'll ask you to just come up, and I'll ask you to take the elements. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Not out of guilt, like I was taught as a Catholic. But do this in, to remember how much I love you. This is a reminder, a physical reminder of, to us of how much he loves us and how much he wants to be in relationship with you on a daily basis. How much he wants to talk to you so that you know his voice and know his word and know his will for your lives. Do you want to come up and say, Lord, I want that. You gave to me this blood and this body so that I could once again be in relationship with the Father, and I don't want to waste that anymore. Do you want to do that? Do you want to come up and do that? I would encourage you to do that. I would say don't wait until the song is done. As the Holy Spirit speaks to you, come up, take it, go somewhere at an altar, back to your pew, don't wait for a, a, a corporate communion. We're not going to do that. And you take it, and you remember what he paid to have you be in daily communion with him, in daily relationship with him, to hear his voice.